Amen. Well, about a year ago, I preached a sermon on Romans chapter 7 and verse 14, where I began with a personal confession. A confession that, sadly, and even really frustratingly, if that's a word, still remains a year later. And that confession is and was that even after my conversion, that I am still tempted to sin, and I even find myself sinning at times. No matter how much, I'd rather not ever sin again. And if you remember in that sermon, this was and is a confession that I believe that every single Christian, even every really, really mature believer, like the Apostle Paul himself, that it's a confession that we all make and confess together. It's the confessions of a sinful Christian, as that sermon was titled a year ago. For Paul said in Romans seven fourteen, for I know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. And then in Romans 7, verses 18 through 19, he also went on to say, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Paul said that. So Paul, even Paul, admits and laments even that he continues to sin. And in that sermon a year ago, we looked at this topic of the source of sin, which is the flesh. And back then, we turned to Galatians chapter 5 to better understand what the flesh is all about. And that just so happens to be the same text and passage that we're in today in our Galatian series. To see similar truths that we saw last year in Romans 7, because this is a kind of parallel passage of sorts in the scripture, both talking about similar things. But we're also going to see today additional key information about the spiritual battle within. It's kind of a part two of that sermon from last, uh, last year, if you will. But this morning, we are going to be looking at the confessions of a spirit-filled Christian, as you see there in our title. And this leads us now to our first point to see from the text. And number one, walk by the Spirit in faith, even in your imperfect frustrations. I want us to see this from Galatians 5 and verses 16 through 18. This is the word of God. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In that sermon on Romans 7 a year ago, I likened the comparison and contrast between the holy and perfect law or God himself versus the apostle Paul as a kind of lopsided boxing match, if you remember. Like trying to compare Mike Tyson in his prime against Napoleon Dynamite. There is no match with that kind of thing. But now to kind of shift the metaphor and that illustration of boxing? Do you see here in that passage that we see a kind of inner boxing match that the spirit-filled believer experiences in the Christian life? Did you see it when we just read it? Fighting in the red corner, weighing at, I don't know how many pounds, actually the flesh here doesn't weigh anything in terms of what it is, but you know, wearing the red shorts, so to speak, in the red corner is the sinful flesh within. And then fighting 
in the blue corner on the other side is the spirit within. Did you see it from the text? You see, the believer, after his or her conversion, every one of us, when we are born again and fully transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in our regeneration, when we're changed, you see, the believer is truly a new man or woman in Christ. They truly are forgiven and justified. And they now have eyes to see and ears to hear. And they love God from the bottom of their hearts. And they're seeking even to love others as well. However, here's the rub. Here's the problem. The flesh that every believer and every person even inherited from Adam and Eve at our births. The flesh which is not here relating to the physical body or, or skin and bones... But the flesh, in terms of what it's talking about here in this passage, is that evil fallen principle within every human being. It's where sin comes from and where sin is drawn out or even prompted by. Coming from within our inner person. It's that fallen principle within our hearts even. In the Bible... The, ref the heart refers to the inner man or woman. All of us internally in that, in that regard and kind of who we are in that way. And so the flesh, of course, uh, is a part of that aspect of our inner person, really flowing to either good or bad things. Both of those types of things come from it within, from the spirit or through the flesh. So do you see here where the Bible or where this battle resides? It resides from within our hearts. This inner boxing match between the flesh and the spirit, the red corner and the blue corner, is the inner battle within the heart where the Christian, the whole Christian life is forged. The flesh is that internal evil where evil comes from. The, the spirit is where that inner internal godliness or desires to glorify God come from. So this is, this is who we are from a biblical worldview uh, as, as human beings and, and specifically as believers who have been transformed. So Paul is saying here, in the similar way that he does, I think, in Romans 7, that we have these opposing inner principles of both the fallen and the sinful flesh and the newly added work, when we were converted, of the spirit within our hearts that began the moment that we were saved. I say it began there because look, before our conversions, before you were saved, there was no boxing match. There was no battle. We were all just flesh, dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians tells us, careless, heartless, and loveless towards God and others. We had no spiritual life prior to getting saved, prior to God's work in our hearts. But once we did get saved as Christians, and if you're a believer, you get this. You understand this because you've experienced it. You're experiencing right now. You've entered this frustrating struggle now once you get saved. And you're unable, as we saw in Romans 7, to perfectly keep the commands of of Jesus, you're unable to completely fulfill the law of Christ in perfect obedience, no matter how hard you try. This side of heaven, there's a struggle, right? We've experienced that. You know, you've experienced that. Why? Why is there that struggle? Why? Because of the remaining flesh, that reality or principle of flesh within. This is the topic of indwelling sin in the Christian life. The sin that comes from within. So to really quickly review and catch us up with a few of the main questions that we answered from the Romans 7 sermon a year ago, as it relates to our sermon today, I want to answer these questions that we answered then, and these are the questions. Why do I sin, and then how long will I continue to have to deal with this frustrating reality of sin in the Christian life? These are important questions, aren't they? Thankfully, the Bible gives us answers. And of course, as we saw, the reason we sin 
is because of that frustrating remaining inner aspect of our sinful flesh that continues even after our conversion. And then we also saw in that sermon that this very discouraging struggle will remain and, and, and continue our entire lives this side of heaven and that we await future glory in the future when we will be completely rid of sin and the flesh. Do, do you look forward to that kind of thing? The Bible gives us this picture of where we're at. But this doesn't mean we have no hope. It doesn't mean that we can't ever have any progress in the Christian life. But it does mean that the Christian life is not some easy picnic. But it's a boxing match or a war within where we're always going to have to be extra aware and extra vigilant about our sinful ways and the way that the flesh can get us off track in the Christian life. We're always going to have to fight and actively put to death sin from within by repenting and actually fighting against it. You see how practical and important it is to understand where we're at and to understand this battle? Now, we're going to be looking at the flesh more here soon in this passage, but before we get there, I want to clarify something up front on this first point that we just read and really nail down what this inner frustration is all about for the Apostle Paul and for us. Or in the words of the passage, let's quickly look at verse 17 again. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So what is keeping us from doing the things that we want according to this passage? And also, what is it that the Apostle Paul wants and that we want as Christians, as he just mentions in verse 17? Now, I think it's clear that this is a parallel passage saying similar things to Romans 7 and that the thing that Paul wanted most in Romans 7 was clearly to obey the law of Christ perfectly, without fail, without error. But that the flesh within kept him in a rather annoying hindrance and a situation almost like a dog yipping and nipping at your heels. It's frustrating. The flesh doesn't allow him to do what he so desires. The, the flesh kept him from fully obeying God the way he most strongly wanted. We saw that. But what does it mean here in Galatians 5? It's hard not to see the parallel when you read it. It's literally the same author. Paul wrote both Galatians and Romans. Galatians first, of course. So I think it's safe to say that Galatians 5 is at least emphasizing the same frustration in part. That frustration of the, the spirit desiring and the flesh preventing him to be perfect and to perfectly obey at all times and in all situations. But I also don't think it would be a stretch looking at this passage to see it going in the other direction as well. Because there is frustration on both sides in the boxing ring, if you will. So the battle between flesh and spirit and the inability to do what you might want to do at any given time, it might also be referring to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to restrain and refrain you from fully pursuing your every fleshly lusts and desires because of the Spirit working that sanctifying work in your heart as well. But because Paul, we see, most identifies with his desire to obey God, I think our default for the Christian life is this spiritual desire to always want to perfectly obey God, even in light of the lifelong struggle with sin and the flesh. And if you're a believer here with us, haven't you experienced this kind of internal battle and struggle yourself? And I don't need a show of hands, but raise your hands in your hearts and minds right now if you could relate to this kind of battle. You can. And, and oh, I am so, so thankful that the Bible has passages like these to explain and give us answers about this really challenging, discouraging, and frustrating reality 
of remaining sin. Can you imagine if we didn't have info and passages and scriptures that explain these types of things? Like if we didn't know why we continued to be tempted to sin, or if we didn't know how long we might be struggling in these ways, or even how to grasp what's going on inside in this inner boxing match. It'd be hard to be in this battle without any direction from God. Praise God that we have direction in his word about these things. You see, we would be so lost in confusion and frustration and despair if we didn't have answers like this because of how difficult and challenging and frustrating this reality is. But Paul here gives us direction in the midst of our problem of remaining sin that we all have. He says, walk by the Spirit through faith day by day. He's like, you might fall. In fact, you will fall at times, but don't use it as an excuse. Get up, dust yourself off, and get back in the fight. This is so hopeful and clarifying. I hope you see how groundbreaking this reality is for you in the Christian life. Because some Christian teachers will tell you things like this. They'll say you're going to be able to reach a point in your life when you reach uh, entire perfection, entire sanctification, this side of heaven when you will no longer sin and no longer have temptations and no longer fall. Some teachers teach that. Maybe you've heard that. That's damaging. How harmful that kind of teaching is. How confusing it is because it's not true. It's completely false. But biblical reality is clarifying. It shows us how things really are. False teaching like that just is exasperating. It's confusing. And it misses important biblical truths that are clearly here. Others on the other side claim that there is no hope ever for any kind of change in growth and maturity on the other hand. But we see here in this text and in the Bible that that's not true either. And we're going to get to that more in our final point. But before we get to that, I want us to look at this pesky reality of the flesh first. And this leads us to our second point for this. And number two, daily put to death the works of the flesh inside you to limit outward sinful actions. Let's see it from the passage in verses 19 through 21. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you. As I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, after reading a list like that, you can see why Paul would say in Romans 7 that nothing good dwells in his flesh, right? I mean, that's an understatement. That's obvious. I mean, that's a nasty list of sins and vices and inner, wicked, destructive thoughts and emotions, right? You just saw them. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to point something out that you may or may not have caught upon just reading it. You, you may have glazed over it or didn't notice it, but I want you to see that really the main argument in verses 19 through 21 is to expose and show that people who practice and make a practice of these works of the flesh that we just read, that list, in an unrepentant lifestyle, are actually, in reality, non-believers who are on their way to hell. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can't be any clearer, despite what someone might say, if they're characterized in these ways, they're not a believer. So if any of these characteristics that we read and we're going to look at are defining where you're at right now, or if you're proudly known by any of them, or if in reality, if you're honest, even if you don't want to admit it, that you're defined and you're described even by one of these many characteristics, then Paul is saying 
that even if you claim to love God, if your life is marked by a kind of unrepentant, patterned lawlessness, then you are not really a Christian and not really a lover of God, even if you say that you are. Now, for those of you with very sensitive consciences and for every single believer here in this room, I want to clarify something here as well. (laughs) And I want to remind you that every believer in here will have struggles with sin that fall into these fleshly categories. You will. I mean, Paul just literally just said that exactly, right? He says that even for the believer, these fleshly desires will battle against the spiritual desires. Do you see that? So this warning of hell in verse 21 can't mean that no believer can struggle with things on this list. But it does mean that no believer will be dominated and given over in an unrepentant kind of way to pursuing these fleshly works in this list either. I mean, the presence of the Spirit won't allow any of that to happen unabated without causing conflict. The Spirit won't allow it. So if you're doing that, if you're pursuing those things, it just reveals that you what? Don't have the spirit, right? But let's quickly look at the flesh lists. And for the sake of time, this will have to be brief. But thankfully, most things on this list are pretty self-explanatory, even as I just read them. And notice Paul doesn't even elaborate on these things here either, but simply lists 16 fleshly characteristics and then adds a, a bucket at the end, kind of, and says, and things like these. So all those 16 sinful, wicked, fleshly things, and he's like, and things like these, to kind of cover all the rest as a kind of catch-all bucket for all the other sinful, fleshly attitudes as well that, that are there. And these 16 in the list, as you see in the scriptures, they have a kind of order to them. They start with sexual sin and then move on to idolatrous religious sins of false worship. Then they move on, he moves on to relational types of sins against other people, which has the most in the list. And lastly, to sins of substance abuse and other kind of wild party living. That's the order it follows. So as we look at these pretty straightforward groups of sin, I want you to think to yourself, whether or not your life is characterized by these fleshly sins. Does this define you? Does this show who you are? In your heart of hearts, is this where you're at? Because if they do, it it means you're not a believer and that you need to repent and turn and believe the gospel even this day. But if you're here and you may struggle with a variety of sins on this list, maybe, but you're not defined by them, then that's, that's the Christian life. That means you're a believer. But as we go through these lists, I want you, believer, if you're a true child of God, I want you to think about how you can put up those boxing gloves and fight as it relates to things on this list in the battle. It makes sense what we're doing here. So the first group is sexual sin, as I mentioned, and that deals with these three, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. And in the sex-obsessed, pornographic culture that we live in today, and even with the inner struggles of sin and temptation that every person on this earth, this side of heaven, has to be faced with in one way or another, this, this list, these things hit close to home. Remember, Jesus calls out not only physical adultery in the Sermon on the Mount, but any kind of sexual immorality in that inner desire and lust in that way, he calls it secret adultery uh, of lust and inner desires as well. So if you're given over fully to any kind of sexual immorality, and just to define our terms, sexual immorality is defined as any sexual act or desire or pursuit that falls outside of sexual activity in marriage between a husband and a wife. That's a big category in our world today. Just look around. We know that. That's a big category that can hit us in our hearts today. Sexual sin, if that 
defines you, then Paul is saying that you will not enter heaven. That you're not a believer. Because believers, you see, seek to fight various temptations and battle and box and to flee and to, and to repent when they fall. They, there's a battle as it relates to this thing. So where are you at today? Are you fighting against all this sexual sin or are you giving yourself to it wholeheartedly and freely? That reveals where you might be today. The second group of sins deals with false worship. The sins of idolatry and sorcery. As John Stott put it, if idolatry is the brazen worship of other gods, sorcery is the secret tampering with the powers of evil. Now to be clear to all of us here, idolatry and not all idolatry is the worship of idols like the golden calf or the worship of images or saints like can sometimes be seen in certain idolatrous religions. That's not where it's limited here. As D.A. Carson helpfully clarifies, this is what he says. Idolatry does not require some little figurine made of stone or clay or pottery or some giant figure of a god carved somewhere out of a mountainside. Idolatry is anything and everything that displaces God, that makes me try to find my identity and place in the universe by something or someone other than God. So we all know examples of blatant, unrepentant, pagan idolatry. And we all likely also have heard of this concept of replacing God with things or intentions or people uh, as well as it relates to idolatry uh, from within. So, so where are you at? Are you fully given over to disregard God in these ways? pursuing false worship and false idolatry, like uh, Cain not worshiping God the way that he required, and unlike Abel who sought to glorify and worship God like he did require, are you pursuing idolatry in your ways? And if you are, if that's what categorizes you, then that means that you're an unbeliever. Because if you're a believer... Though idolatry and competing factions and things in your life may, may be there, but there will be a daily battle and struggle to put it to death your whole lives, just like there will be a daily battle to put sexual sin in the last group together. Fight in all of these areas as believers. Where are you at when it relates to this? The third group of sins is relational sins against other people. And there are eight of them. This is by far the largest group of sins that Paul lists. Sins against other people. And kind of following up on our sermon last week on Christian cannibalism, where uh, people in the church were biting or could bite and devour one another and kind of consume one another and cause disunity in an unhealthy church in that regard. This kind of falls into that category, doesn't it? Here they are, all eight of them. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. Now, of course, there's a lot to be said about each of those, but that's a pretty straightforward list relating to actions of inner sinful emotions and thoughts and pursuits and activity inside us towards others in the flesh. If you're characterized by these sins... And if you're in unrepentant rage and fits of anger and in divisive ways and who you are and you're causing strife and dissensions amongst people as a way of life almost, it's, that's what you're known by, or a habitual living practice of your life, this means that you're not a believer and that you're actually on your way to judgment and that you, if you're categorized like this, you are someone who needs to get saved here. You're, Paul is giving directions that you're not going to get to heaven if this categorizes you. So that means you're an unbeliever needing to get saved. So we need to examine ourselves. Are we categorized by this? Where are we at in these things? What is our life about? Now, we even saw last week that even in unhealthy churches, Christians can fall into these sins in one way or another. 
But if there is no repentance and change and fight and struggle in these things, if you're just, for example, just known as a gossip and who you are and what you just always do, that's just who you are, you know, as an example, then, then that means that you're just not a believer, even if you say that you are. So we need to all examine ourselves and see where we're at as it relates to this. And if you are a believer, you will fight against these sins and try to put them to death and turn from them your whole entire life. And so that's the, the encouragement here is to continue to fight against these sins. And the fourth and last group of the flesh has to do with the party animals out there in the world who are given over to substance abuse and a party lifestyle and practice. Here the last two are. They are drunkenness and orgies, as we just read. These are sins that are well known in a worldly kind of disregard and a party lifestyle and the abuse of alcohol or other substance in an unrepentant way or who go to parties and places like, uh, I don't know, Vegas or spring break tropical trips to get wasted and pursue all kinds of sexual immorality with anyone and everyone. That's what this list is. Not to say that anybody who ever goes to Las Vegas or goes on a tropical vacation or pursuing those things, of course, but you get my point, right? It's that kind of wild, licentious party living, just given over to the, to the flesh. It's the kind of hedonism that we see so often in our world today. These last two characteristics also reveal a kind of lawlessness, and if practiced by anyone... In these ways, we know that they're on a road to hell, as Paul clearly shows in this passage. So does this category de describe you in any way? Are you drawn to substance abuse or party in any kind of way? I'm just like in all these things, uh, if you are, if that's who you are, it means you're an unbeliever. But if you're a Christian, it means you're going to turn away from these aspects on this list. You're going to fight against it. Because with all these things that we just looked, those 16 different things in these four different categories, we have to put up our dukes and fight and battle against them in the Christian life. Battle against the fleshly appetites and inclinations. Seek to avoid them at all costs. This is part of the Christian life. If you're a believer, you know what that battle is. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourself, I don't struggle in these ways at all. Well, as we know from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount and Paul in his writings here in the letters, if there's any internal inclination even, even if not an outward action upon it, even a temptation or inner drawing or attitudes in any of these ways, we just realize that we need to put those to death as well. I think that all of us would have some fighting to do on this list. And if not, if you couldn't find anything on that list, Paul adds that bucket and things like these. So I know we should all find something evil and fleshly and sinful inside to do battle with if we're honest because, like I mentioned, nobody has arrived and nobody is perfect because in the Christian life, if you're a believer and you're honest about it, there's going to be a daily battle. So you're going to have to train daily, fight daily, because the flesh is there daily until glory. Does that make sense? I mean, that is true for every believer here. It's a good reminder from the Apostle Paul. And this leads us now to our final point. There is not just one side of the boxing match, not just the red corner of sin and the flesh, but there's also the blue corner as well. So this leads us to point number three. And this, progressively cultivate the fruit of the Spirit inside you to manifest outward godly Actions. Look with me at verses 22 through 26 for this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So we just looked at the passage and dealt with and saw the internal, sinful, fleshly intentions and actions in our second point. Now we're going to deal with that pursuing of godly actions instead if we're believers. 
And I hope you can see that just as the works of the flesh came from within and need to be battled and attacked daily with counter punches because they creep up from within, the works of the Spirit also come from within as well. But the fruit of the Spirit is not natural in that it does not occur in every single person like the flesh does. Everybody's born in sin in the flesh. Not everybody's born again. Not everybody has the Spirit. Because only believers who have been transformed and given the Spirit will display this fruit. Does that make sense? And many have pointed out rightly that the word fruit is in the singular and not the plural. Do you notice that? Even though Paul lists nine different characteristics or fruits, but the fruit is singular. Why? Because the work of the Spirit actually produces all nine of these attributes in every single believer. If you're a Christian, you will have this fruit in one degree to another. So it's not like you'll find a Christian, whether it's yourself or somebody else, who only displays one or two of these and not the rest. I mean, spiritual gifts are different, and everybody has different spiritual gifts. Nobody has the same spiritual gifts. But the passage here is revealing that every single Christian will have spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, to one degree or another. All nine of them. Paul says that against these nine fruits of the Spirit, there is no law. Did you see that? At the end of verse 23, as we just read it, he also pointed that out earlier as it relates to verse 18, that we're no longer under law. That's kind of been the recurring topic of the book of Galatians. So it's no surprise that he brings up the law as it relates to the work of the Spirit here. So I want you to see that this is where the rubber meets the road in the Christian life. Paul is showing in more detail here what he has shown us throughout the letter as he pointed them continually back to the Spirit through faith over and over. We've seen it throughout the letter. Remember, he said to them, why have you gone back to the works of the flesh after beginning in the Spirit? And he's continued to call the Galatian believers back to the Spirit through faith, working itself out in love, not by fleshly works of the law and not by licentious or licensed type of living to sin, as we saw last week. So the anecdote here to this issue of the law and the way forward in actual Christian living, I hope you can see, is seen here in this aspect of walking by the Spirit or living by the Spirit as this section is just driving home for us from the Apostle Paul. And before we quickly run through and discuss these nine fruits, I want to make a quick observation about how this all works. The Christian life is a walking and living in the Spirit by faith which actually includes us actively pursuing these things as believers, but it also includes more foundationally God, the Holy Spirit, working these things in and through our hearts by faith as well. So we are not, as some people claim in the Christian life, fully just passive in our Christian life, nor are we just only active by ourselves without God either. Both of those are errors. The Christian life is both God working and transforming and giving faith and growth and fruit that only he can produce. And it's also us seeking to obey and apply and act in these ways as well. Both of those are important for us to grasp. Now, justification, of course, is by God's grace alone without any of our works or anything involved at all. We've, we've mentioned that. It's not by works of the law. But we are declared righteous or justified through faith alone. We receive that through faith, not by good works, not by good life actions, not by anything in us, but everything in God. That's justification. But another important doctrine is sanctification, which is just the doctrine of the Christian life which is, by the way, the topic of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you see that connection? You see, sanctification, of course, involves God foundationally, but it also involves us living out our lives and pursuing God daily and acting in faith and acting by the Spirit through faith in love, to love, right? We've seen that in our passage and in this letter. 
So, with those clarifications, what are these fruits anyways? And do you have them? Because just like thinking about the flesh lists, look, if you don't have these fruits, if you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, and don't display any of these fruits, you're not saved. Now, you don't get saved by these fruits, but if you are saved or justified first, you will have these fruits as evidence. Does that make sense? So in all these nine characteristics, uh, we could easily spend a full sermon on each one. We're not going to do that, of course. They're all things that God works in us, and we also to seek and should seek to cultivate one day at a time in the Christian life as Believers, And I want us to see this too, that none of these will be perfect this side of heaven. And in these nine fruits will also be something that we progressively, slowly but surely grow in through our whole entire life, little by little until the very last day that we live, even hour by hour. And we will in the long run see progressively growth and sanctification, even in, even in ups and downs, or even if it's really little growth at times. But we will have it if you're a believer. In some part, we will display these, these, the fruit of the Spirit if we're Christians. So daily, my challenge to you and Paul's real charge to us all is to seek to cultivate these nine fruits so that you might manifest godly behaviors and actions in the Christian life. So what are they? The first one, by no surprise, is love. Of course, of course love is the top of the list, right? Paul tells us, remember in 1 Corinthians 13, often quoted at marriage ceremonies and weddings, if you don't have love, you don't have nothing. You got nothing if you don't have love. And we saw last week that our loving of God and neighbor fulfills the law of Christ. So by all means, Christians, do whatever you can to cultivate and pursue love of God and neighbor in this church and in our community and in our world. And remember, since these things are very straightforward, we can kind of blow by blow through them all like Paul does for the sake of time. And let's continue on to the, to the next two, joy and peace. Think today, believer, how can I increase joy in my life? How can I see all the reasons to be content and rejoice always? And how can I pursue peace with others as opposed to the fleshly fights and battles that sometimes come naturally to us because of the flesh? Daily, Christians, seek to cultivate these things and see how God might produce in you more and more fruit of the Spirit. Or think of patience and kindness. Eh. Is it just me? Or are these fruits just really needing, needed to be consciously on our minds every single day? We, we need to be reminded of these things because sometimes we'll fail in these ways. Now, the Spirit will work these things in us, but I hope you see the flesh battles against the Spirit here, right? We can be selfish and hasty and impatient at times. Or... We can seek to be consciously cultivating and displaying the fruit of patience and the related kindness to everyone around us as we seek to do good to other people by loving them and fulfilling the law of Christ as we're going to see next week specifically. Or think of goodness and faithfulness. The flesh points us to badness and faithlessness. But you see, the spirit counterpunches towards good actions and thoughts towards others and is a kind of dependable, it leads us to a kind of dependable faithfulness that could only be described and explained by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. You see, the fruit points to God's work in you, and you can't boast in that. You glorify God by that as a witness and testimony. So I want to encourage all of us to cultivate these things even battle against these things and work through these things against the flesh so that you might seek to love and desire to do these things as believers towards other believers as characteristics. I want you to put off, as other passages of Scripture say, the evil desires of the flesh and put on these good 
fruit of the Spirit instead every single day. You need to battle. It's a combat game or, or fight or issue. It's not just something that we just coast to, but it is a fight. It is a war. The last two fruits are to cultivate gentleness and self-control. This is last but not least, okay? These are important too. And look, wouldn't our church be a healthier and flourishing place if we saw more of all these fruits than we did the works of the flesh? As, as we see more, I'm not saying that we don't have it, we do have it, but don't we wanna see more? And wouldn't more be better than less? We need more of this fruit, what, a, what an amazing thing. It, we need to combat the works of the flesh and put forward the, this fruit so that we might be kind to one another, gentle, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave us, as other passages say. And this aspect of self-control even, really, do you see how it combats all 16 of the works of the flesh we already looked at? The works of the flesh are all impulsive, carnal, lack of any self-control and lack of any purity. But the Holy Spirit, you see, he works in us self-control in this boxing match of the Spirit as the Spirit bobs and weaves and counter punches and uppercuts every single day for the glory of God and for our good in this battle, in this war. The spirit and the flesh are in conflict every day. We need to have this before our minds as we consider to cultivate the fruit of the spirit. But with all this conflict we've been looking at, we can easily get discouraged, can't we? We can almost think, What's the use? What's the point? If I'm always going to be struggling in some way until that future glory, why not just give up? Well, the Spirit will not let you, thankfully, give up in that way, dear believer. He won't let you quit. He will keep you going in the fight until the end. You see, believers will persevere because the Spirit, true believers, if they're true believers, the Spirit will continue to lead and work and be in you, working internally even in this battle as he leads you forward in these difficult and trying days. So walk by the Spirit. Cultivate spiritual fruit. And don't lose heart, Christian. Don't lose heart because as we saw in Galatians 2.20 before, we have been crucified with Christ. And as we just saw there in Galatians 5.24, and I want you to see it again, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Don't lose heart. The gospel has dealt a death blow to our flesh if you are a believer. No, it doesn't mean that we're going to attain perfection this side of heaven, but it does mean that if we're a Christian, this gospel-centered justification we've been seeing, that even that helps us, that gospel helps us draw hope in the work of Jesus for us on the cross to help us with our daily sin problem today. We can know right now in confidence that we are and we will victorious and conquerors and we will ultimately win in the end we don't have to fight this battle with the fear that the flesh will somehow win out in the end if we're true believers we can know and have confidence in the spirit that he will ultimately work in us and carry out into completion the good work that he worked in us as philippians shows us that we will be victorious that we will continue on even when it looks so hard and so tempting and so struggling we can fight and battle and put to death the deeds of the flesh now in confidence of this gospel by faith so i encourage all of us to preach and dwell upon the gospel the good news to yourselves every single day day by day in the battle gain strength and in, 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 in confidence in this battle, even when times are bad or when temptations are bombarding you, remind yourself that when the flesh hits, the spirit hits harder. And don't lose heart as you battle day by day. You see, Paul ends where he begins, and that is that constant need to walk in the spirit and to live and to keep in step with the spirit. Or else, he shows us again, we might fall back into sinful practices. 
It's like he knows how we struggle and battle in these ways, doesn't he? Because Paul does know. Because he struggled in these ways as well. And he gives us right at the end of these two long lists of flesh and the spirit, this big contrast that he has. He comes back once again to tell us to walk by the spirit. But then again, he says in verse 26, to avoid the flesh, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Like a broken record, Paul continues to put that forward. Make sure that you are being reminded every day that you will have this back and forth conflict, this battle in the Christian life, but make sure that you're always aware of both the flesh and the spirit, for Paul puts forward both of these realities, both the confessions of a sinful Christian and the confessions of a spirit-filled Christian. Such is the life of the believer this side of heaven. So lace up your boxing gloves and get ready to fight. Walk by the spirit, live by the spirit, do things that cultivate faith in the spirit, Engage the spirit through prayer and Bible reading and study and singing and coming to worship and to hearing the truth and, and, and fellowship with God's people and whatever else you could think of that's going to cultivate faith. Do that day by day. Live by the spirit and keep in step with the spirit in your lifelong opposition and war against the many, many desires of the flesh. And pray with me for God's help in these things and in this battle. Father, we thank you for your word and how powerful it is and how much it directs us to the things of life and the realities and struggles that we all face. We trust you. We look to you. We ask for your help. We rely upon you. Help all of us to be able to continue to pursue walking in the spirit, Lord, we need your help on our own. We will abandon ship, but with you, oh, with the work of your spirit, you will keep us and work in us and continue to bless us. Would you do that in us? Would you do that in every single believer here in this room? We say this in Christ's name, amen.